With the launch of the Saturn, digital was still seen as the logical controller input method, but Sega had seen promise in analog and went to work designing a controller that would truly capture the arcade experience at home. A year and a half after the Saturn's release, Sega released their analog controller dubbed the 3D Control Pad, a couple of weeks removed from the N64's debut. The controller looked like an updated DEMPA XE1AP, but refined to better accommodate digital inputs. The right thumbstick was gone, but in turn we received a digital D-pad on the left side, and the first ever full analog shoulder mount trigger buttons. The most interesting thing about the Saturn 3D controller was the detachable cable. The manual even discusses it, but no one really knew why Sega went that route. No other major home console manufacturer had controllers with detachable cables, so why did Sega? This is Retro Impressions' Secret of the 3D Analog Gamepad. The Saturn's 3D analog controller was very unique, as it was the logical first in many regards while carrying on the legacy of many important past innovations. Expansions for home consoles weren't anything new, devices such as the voice module for the Intellivision, the more well-known Sega CD, and of course the iconic 32X had all pushed the gaming industry in a new direction. The concept of a hardware add-on was typically used as a cost-saving measure to extend the life and capability for the user installed base. The 3D controller was no different. The user would invest in a high-quality gamepad, and Sega intended to reward those people with more affordable access to game peripherals designed to enhance the at-home experience. In total, there were 10 add-ons planned that were clearly far enough along that they could have easily shipped. So let's have a look at what Sega had planned, where those ideas came from, and in some cases, where the tech landed. First up is a joystick offered in two varieties, one top mount, the other a side mount. Sega's connection to the modern joystick goes back to at least 1969 with the release of their arcade game Missile, which was played using a two-way joystick with integrated fire button. The evolution was quick to four and eight-way designs becoming standard equipment as the arcade scene rose to prominence. The joystick was also fundamental to their home market strategy, especially considering these consoles were intended to bring the Sega arcade experience home. The integration started with their first packing controller for their first home console, the SG-1000. Sega also made standalone joysticks of higher quality for the SG-1000 should the player want a more arcade quality experience. While there was no arcade stick specifically for the Master System, unless you count the control stick, the Mega Drive received high quality 3 and 6 button variations. They would continue to offer quality arcade sticks up through the Dreamcast, so it's no real shocker as to why it was considered here. Sega and Haptic Feedback go way back as they pioneered its use in video games with their 1976 release Motocross, also released under the name Fawns and Man TT. The Aurora Interactor was the first home game haptic feedback device, but Sega wasn't involved in its development, though it was compatible with the Genesis. The Interactor was also a body vest, something that's still being explored, but has yet to really catch on. I think it's safe to assume that the inspiration was lifted from Sega's line of arcade games that continued to incorporate force feedback into their controls. With the 3D gamepad expansion capabilities, Sega felt it was time to bring the arcade experience home. The unit intended for the Saturn was called the Vibrations Expansion Unit, and had it shipped, it would have predated the N64 Rumble Pack by a year. While it didn't make it to consumers' hands as planned, it did ship at launch for the Dreamcast in a form that remained essentially unchanged from the 3D gamepad version. One add-on that might seem like an odd fit was the Photo Signal Detecting Expansion Unit. It's a mouthful, but essentially the bones for a light gun add-on. Sega's connection to gun games goes way back to 1969 with their arcade hit, Duck Hunt. With that said, we're going to be looking strictly at the consumer market for this segment. Sega had released three light guns prior to this, the Light Phaser on the Master System, Menacer on the Mega Drive, and Stunner for the Saturn. They all gave essentially the same gaming experience. The playfields were static or on-rail screens with no player control. 
What makes this unique is the idea behind the unit was to combine a deeper integrated level of control that didn't depend on another standalone gamepad. The idea may sound familiar because it was reworked into the official Sega Dreamcast light gun, which featured an integrated D-pad. In games such as Big Car Hunter, the D-pad enabled the player to change their view of the playfield. This would quickly be picked up by Namco, who integrated the idea into their GunCon 2, a peripheral that saw quite a bit of success. Trackballs were a mainstay of early gaming, but had hardly seen support on a consumer level since the mid-80s. Sega had intentions to rectify this with plans for a trackball expansion, which again had two offerings, a simple top mount and a more complex bottom mount. As far as home systems go, Sega released a trackball called the Sports Pad along with a rotary dial called the Paddle Controller on the Master System. Had this add-on released for the Saturn, it would have been the last first-party trackball for a home console. At this point, that honor goes to Bandai Pippin, which released in North America as an Apple product. The handle expansion unit might sound like an odd name, but it's one Sega had used since entering the consumer market as a designation to their steering wheel controllers. This again has very deep roots in the home market, with their first entry hitting homes in 1985. This controller was available in two varieties, a bike handle and a steering wheel. These were compatible with the SG-1000, SC-3000, and Master System. Sega would later partner with Hori and release an updated first-party handle controller for the Master System, which would remain exclusive to Europe. With Virtual Racing's high-profile Mega Drive release on the horizon, Sega was well underway developing a full analog handle controller to release alongside the game. The controller had full tilt, extension, and an integrated controller set based on the six-button gamepad. No one knows why, but even after showcasing it one month before the game's release, Virtual Racing released while the steering wheel didn't. What's odd is that in the official Sega magazine, the steering wheel was discussed as being on schedule to release slightly after Virtual Racing. This was one month before the game hit store shelves, and it makes me wonder if there's analog steering support baked in to the Mega Drive and 32X versions that no one's yet to discover. Not even a year later, Sega would have released that exact racing controller on the Saturn, with the only alterations being labeling and the cord. As I said before, the controller was based on the six button gamepad, so not all buttons are present that a player might require for some games, even if all racing games were required to support the device. The handle controller was an extension of this idea, giving the player full controller support in the process. One of the more ambitious offerings was an inclination detection expansion unit with and without rumble support. This essentially turned the 3D gamepad into a motion controller. Again, this is an idea Sega pioneered with the release of Hang On, a game that literally required the player to sit on a bike and control the game using their body. Okay, technically Hang On might not be the first, but that's a debate for another channel. The other two contenders are also Sega games. The 1981 KO Punch-Out where you hit a bag, which translated the impact force and speed into an on-screen action. There is also the 1976 release Heavyweight Champ, which is controlled using two levers representing your in-game character's arms. Unfortunately, not much is known about either game, and the 1976 Heavyweight Champ is unknown to have any working cabinets. Sega had dabbled a bit in motion control on the Genesis with the activator, but that didn't really work out on a technical level, leaving it as a novelty piece to later inspire Microsoft. Sega would move their motion control idea to the Dreamcast, releasing it as the fishing controller, the only first-party fishing controller, as is often pointed out by diehard Dreamcast fans. Looks like you got a fish on there, sir. A couple of interesting notes. The controller was not only compatible with six fishing games, but also worked as a fully functional motion controller when playing Virtual Tennis and Soul Calibur. Also, it appears it was planned for the Saturn as the US patent filing showcases it plugged into a Saturn console. This filing also reveals plans to utilize this motion technology in a sword, baseball bat, and golf club. Even though devices such as Batter Up were available on the Genesis, Sega's first party motion controller promised and delivered unique integrated control experiences unlike anything prior. Here comes the pitch. High 
fly down the line to the left. It's gone. Grand Slam. The infrared receiver is easily the least interesting on this list as it would have made the controller wireless. It's based on the same tech used in all bad wireless controllers of that era, and the Saturn did receive wireless game pads that are said to be the best feeling but exhibit the same issues of tech from that era. The last three things we'll be looking over in one segment. There is the memory expansion unit, a clock, and a display expansion unit which was intended to show additional game info to the player. More on that in a moment. But let's roll back to the memory expansion. Prior to the introduction of disk-based media, companies would rely on password systems, onboard memory via EEPROM, battery backup memory, or in the case of the Famicom disk system, the disk containing the game was writable so the info was stored there. With that being the case, the first instance of a separate removable memory card or CART was for the Neo Geo, allowing owners of the home system to transfer their data between the AES consumer console and the arcade. With the launch of the Sega CD and CD-ROM-ROM, onboard memory for saved files was limited, so compact external options were offered. In Sega's case, this was the CD backup RAM card. The Saturn also offered RAM cart to again deal with the limited onboard storage the Saturn offered for saved games. While the solution was perfect for the Sega CD, the PC Engine CD ROM ROM and Saturn faced a similar hurdle as they supported expansions of system memory via the same card slot. The Saturn's extended RAM cart acted much like the more well known N64 Jump Pack, giving 1 to 4 meg of extended working RAM, which was utilized by nearly 50 games. What the cart didn't offer was space to save a game. Saturn's solution appeared to be integrating this feature into their 3D gamepad as a standalone card, but it never shipped. Let's quickly touch on the clock. The intended feature outside of the clock itself was to show how long the controller had been connected, show total playtime on the system, how long a specific game had been played, and to allow the player the ability to time in-game events. To see how these are all connected, we need to look at the Dreamcast and see where it all landed. As I said, the Saturn didn't catch on, so development quickly shifted to the Dreamcast, with this controller being an evolution of the 3D control pad. The onboard memory, clock, and video monitor plan for the Saturn was combined into the VMU, and Sega doubled down on their expansion concept, including two dedicated slots, with the controller cable now permanently affixed to the unit. Sega's work innovating for the Saturn was quite ambitious, and due in part to poor US sales, the Dreamcast was the console that reaped most of the rewards for work done for and intended to release on the prior generation. I hope you found this video insightful, and if you enjoyed it, consider checking out my video on the analog controller. That's it for now, and until next time, thank you for watching Retro Impressions.